Do you think that just the way we are talking about a lot, lot of cultural movement when it comes to security, AI, ML, and other things, do you see that companies also need to have a data strategy? They also need to have a cultural change within them when they look at data also differently, where, you know, once again, it's not a silo, it's not, hey, databases, we don't care. We just have to care about the new business application that we're writing. What I'm asking is that, do you see that we need cultural changes or you are seeing cultural changes around data? Because data is the new oil, so we do need to focus a lot on that. If you go back into the year 2009, you know, you had a, the, the NoSQL movement at its peak. You know, databases have been created quicker, you know, than Kubernetes extensions uh, today. So it's it's basically, yeah, as an application developer, you've been flooded with new databases that that derive uh, deprive from the um, that deprive from the uh, relational database uh, architecture, you know, and um, and since then, a lot of them they are they became very popular and um, they have conquered their own niches. So in, in this regard, um, you know, there was a cultural change in managing data for application developers. And you, know, you have to also see how this connects to uh, the emergence uh, of, um, of microservice-based architectures. Because in a, in a monolith, you have one database technology. And um, you know, adding more databases to one application makes things very complicated. So think about a, a classic Java app where you have you know, an object object relational mapper like Hibernate or anything, you, you wouldn't dare to, to use a second database. But if you split that application into smaller um, into smaller apps, you know, you can use different application languages, uh, different programming languages for different applications or different services. And you can use different data stores as well. So the the um, idea of, of of different databases and you know, the, the NoSQL movement with making the availability of new technologies much richer, together with microservices, you know, naturally, that only was possible because of, of the progress in automating, um, you know, software operations. Because if you have more apps to operate and more databases to take care of, you need to do that more efficiently. Otherwise, the increased number uh, of of you know, of different technologies increases operational complexity and you would suffocate the advantage you get from it. So you have to see all those things into, it's, it, you know, as, as, as being interconnected because they can only make progress along each other. They cannot, they cannot move isolated from another. And uh, so at some, at some t points in time, there, there are basically, ga not gaps, but, but, uh, fast advantages, like, for example, the emergence of, um, of declarative uh, automation technologies that if you think about, if you think about uh, the ephemeral VM and persistent disk paradigm for a second, because that's the game changer that, that, that caused the leap from imperative to declarative uh, automation, in my opinion. Is if you think about Chef, for example, the underlying assumption is you have a physical or virtual server somewhere, and then you download instructions, and with a little bit of context information, you execute a predefined set of, of techniques. But the, the idea is still a long-running machine. And that's the basic break in assumptions that comes with the ephemeral VM and persistent disk. The, and that is only possible because network bandwidth became much quicker. So with a 10 gigabit network, you can remotely attach a disk with sufficient performance and you gain the ability to reattach that persistent disk, that virtual hard disk drive, so to say, to any server in the cluster. And that basically opens up the possibility to repair servers, which means that you, you don't have to buy the most expensive servers anymore. And it also allows to make that programmatically once visualization is there. And once you can make that programmatically, you can destroy servers as part of your lifecycle management. So for example, if you think about making a database bigger in a Postgres database, you need to take out the secondaries first, make them bigger. At some point, you need to take out the primary. So you need failure detection, you need an automatic failover, a, a promotion of a new primary. And if you do that, you can basically make a database bigger without major impact on the service by recreating those virtual machines from scratch, from a known state. 
So if you think about that, that's, that's a huge change in attitude. That's a huge change in the tools you would use to tackle that problem. And it enables exactly that operational efficiency that makes microservices worth, worth it. You can use a, a programming language here and a different there because build packs and container um, uh, technologies allow you to make that, you know, deployment quick and simple and low overhead. And the, for data, bootstrapping a new database is just a single command, making a backup, single command, and scaling out w from one, you know, a virtual machine to three or one pod to three, just a single command. So you shift the operational responsibility towards the application developer by increasing the depth of automation. And that shifts culture and that shifts enables innovation, which is what it's actually meant to do.